autonomic nervous system. First thing we want to do with the autonomic nervous system is uh, define it as separate from another part of the, uh, the nervous system we call the somatic. Okay? So the somatic nervous system is really what we think of as the conscious part of our brain. This is, this is the activity of your nervous system that you're aware of. When people say your five senses, they're typically talking about the senses that you are typically most aware of. There are many more senses than five in your human body. But people are generally aware of these five senses. Your motor activities, using your skeletal muscles, is a conscious activity. You know that smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are involuntary. It's basically the involuntary parts of your human body are the ones that we associate with the autonomic nervous system. So the, the term somatic just means body, and it's being used here to describe the parts of my body that I'm conscious of. Um, you have a couple of pictures in your textbook that look like this that sort of show you here's a somatic motor neuron, a motor neuron that's running out to a skeletal muscle. Here's an autonomic nerve that's going out to some organ in your human body, you know, working the smooth muscle, say, of the large intestine. So the autonomic nervous system is a part of the nervous system that's hand handling the unconscious or involuntary things throughout your human body. It's kind of like you and I don't have to pay any attention to taking care of the utilities in this building or keeping the room warm. Or there are just all sorts of things that are run for us behind the scenes that make our lives a little easier. You know, some of the activities that are involved here that you would think of in your human body would be things like heart rate, okay, blood pressure, your breathing, digestive activities, and there'd be many, many other autonomic activities. These are four real common ones. These are things you don't have to think about but that are managed for you behind the scenes. You know, your heart rate needs to change from time to time. You don't have to think, oh, I need to do more of that or less of that. It takes care of it for you. Now, if you think back to our study of the brain, maybe you can remember there were two distinct centers that control an awful lot of this, right? You remember where those two were? Mm. Hypothalamus, right? Hypothalamus here is a major autonomic nervous center for what kinds of activities? Temperature. Kind of the, the catch-all here would be chemical activities. Right? Temperature, thirst, hunger, um, any sort of cycles in your human body. Daily rhythmic cycles, menstrual cycle, things like that. Hypothalamus. What's the other major center here? Anybody? Huh? Not epithalamus. Thank you for guessing, though. Not epithalamus. Hmm? Medulla oblongata, yes. Medulla oblongata. Major autonomic nerve center for what kinds of activities? Automatic. Well, yeah, both of, all of these are automatic, right? Okay? The muscular, okay, this is muscular kinds of things. These are physical, mechanical kinds of things, right? 
So the hypothalamus monitors your bloodstream for what's going on chemically throughout the human body. Hypothalamus can sense your body temperature from the blood, your nutritional level from the blood, the water level in your body from the blood, all the other chemicals and hormones, sexual hormones, all of those things that are circulating throughout your body can all be sensed from the bloodstream. The medulla has got wirings right into your smooth muscles, different organs in your body, and it is sensing what's going on there. Now, all of these autonomic processes are pretty simple. Okay? And one of the ways to sort of con conceive of what's going on here is to think that these processes are simple things like maintaining the temperature of the room. A system has been designed and set up to keep the temperature of this room fairly stable. And this is basically what these autonomic activities are trying to do within you. Um, for things to happen, for chemical processes like nerve action to happen in certain ways, there must be a stable molecular sort of activity. And that happens at certain temperatures. We maintain a stable body temperature mostly so that our nervous system can function the way it does. So, I want you to think for a minute about um, some of these processes again, right? Like heart rate is a very simple process. You know, the heart is going to beat on its own, but sometimes I need to speed it up. Sometimes I need to slow it down, just like in this room here. Sometimes I mean, it might need to heat it up a little bit. Sometimes I might need to cool it down a little bit to try and keep the temperature the same. Blood pressure is going to be like that. I may need to raise my blood pressure at times. I may need to lower my blood pressure. I need the ability to do that. Breathing. Sometimes you're breathing faster. Sometimes you're breathing slower. Digestion. Got a big meal there, I'm going to accelerate my digestion. If, I'm not, if I don't have much in my stomach, I'm going to slow down or decelerate my digestion. So all of these, when I say this is simple, it's basically all of these processes, you either want more of it or less of it, don't you? Right? And again, there would be other autonomic activities here to talk about. But it, it comes down to a pretty simple thing, more of something or less of something. Now, just think through this entire sort of process with me for a moment. Right? Room temperature is maintained through a control system, right? If the room is too cool, what are you going to do? You're going to warm it up, right? If the room is too warm, you're going to cool it down. It's as simple as that. And that's really your autonomic nervous system is functioning in that simple way. The control systems that help us keep the room temperature the same, right? There's, there's going to be several elements that you would always see here. For one, there would be a thermostat, right? Uh, you, I think every one of us probably has a house where there's some sort of thermostat that controls the temperature of your house or your apartment or whatever, Right? If you don't know the temperature of the room, there is no chance that you're going to control it. And so every thermostat has got some sort of a thermometer in it, some sort of an, uh, something that is going to figure out what the temperature is. Okay, there's also going to be a set point here. There's going to be a place where you can set what you want the temperature to be, right? Right? So you've got to know what it is, and you've got to know what you want it to be. And when you compare those two things, then you find out that you either want to heat, right? You want to increase whatever it is, and there's some sort of an increaser mechanism, like in this house there'd be a heater of some kind somewhere. 
So if the temperature falls below the set point, then the heater is going to come on. It's also going to be some sort of decreaser mechanism. In this case, it would be like the air conditioner that's going to cool things down. Now, just think, every one of your autonomic processes are going to be similar to this. Okay? And the whole purpose of this is to maintain that steady state, isn't it? You want to have some sort of stable process going on within the human body that you don't have to pay attention to. Let's think about temperature regulation in the human body related to this. Okay? The hypothalamus here has a temperature sensor like a thermostat. It's going to be able to figure out from the bloodstream what the temperature of the blood is. It's also going to have within it a set point. It's going to say, this is what the temperature of the body should be. And as it compares what it should be to what it is, the hypothalamus is then going to engage heating mechanisms or cooling mechanisms throughout the human body to make this happen. All right? Getting, getting the, the overall concept of this, you know, all autonomic stuff really comes down to this either have more of something or less of something. Right? Heart rate, I either want more of it or I want less of it. Right? Blood pressure, I either want more of it or less of it. Right? Breathing. There are times when I need to breathe more, sometimes when I need to breathe less. Right? Digestion. Now, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two divisions, which are basically the more division and the less division. Right? These, these are the two. There is a sympathetic division to the autonomic nervous system, and you think of this as the more, sort of, within your human body. Think of it as your emergency override system. Or if you want to put it in terms of a car, it's like the gas pedal in the car. Revs you up. Speeds things up. And then there's a parasympathetic side of things. This is, the, this is the whole side of the autonomic nervous system that slows you down, that calms you down. Right? This is the peaceful side of things. And so my brain and my autonomic centers engage various activities throughout my body in one of two ways. And it's really as simple as that. Now, if you've taken a psychology class, most of you have probably taken psychology by now, right? You got into this, didn't you? This is one of the big topics in psychology. It's autonomic nervous system. Do you remember what we called the, what's going on in your body when you have lots of sympathetic stimulation? Yeah, it's the fight or flight response, right? This is the sympathetic side of things. And this is sort of the old illustration. You're in the woods. I think this, this comes from hundreds of years ago where most people lived in, you know, out in uh, nature where, you know, there were animals out in nature that might pose threats to you. You know, if you run this through the central, peripheral, and central nervous system, you become aware of danger. You process that through your brain. Activity goes out to your skeletal muscles to get you away from the danger or deal with the danger, but at the same time you're engaging all sorts of autonomic functions that help the skeletal muscles do more of what they do. Okay? Extreme sympathetic response is sort of an emergency response. It's, it's what we call this fight or flight sort of response. That's the easiest way to deal with it. This this bear thing is 
you know, been the traditional thing is probably doesn't apply so much these days. I like this picture here. There's a fight or flight response. Yo. Yeah. But what might it be for you or I? I mean, what would engage this for us typically? Yeah. Or you hear a noise at night, right? You're in bed and it's late and you hear some noise and it's like, oh my gosh, what's that? Right? Or it, or it could be, a, you know, typically an automobile accident, a near miss on the freeway, you know, or somebody does something crazy that you don't expect and all of a sudden you slam on the brakes or something either happens or nearly happens. And all of a sudden you're feeling different than you were just moments before that. And you have nothing to say about it. Every one of us is alike in this. We are all built with this sympathetic system. And when you perceive danger, it goes into effect. Okay, what kind of things happen when you're in this fight or flight response? Huh? Well, yeah. But physically, what do I, what do I feel? What happens to my heart? Okay, your heart rate speeds up, right? You don't have anything to say about that. It just automatically starts running. What else? Okay, heart rate is going to raise blood pressure, right? What else? Respiratory rate goes way up. Now, what's the purpose for all of these? Why do all of these things go up? Why? More, More oxygen, right? if my muscles and my thinking, if everything is going to work so I can deal with the danger, I need more oxygen. More oxygen is going to give me more energy, more ability to process. Everything is going to function there. What about digestion? (coughs) I don't need to be digesting in in a danger? No, of course not. Sympathetic stimulation is going to shut down my digestion. It shuts down other things, too. You know, people that are in dangerous situations will often look like they've seen a ghost or they'll go pale, more pale than they are, right? What is the system doing? Shutting down blood flow to the skin, isn't it? Right? So that if I am in a dangerous situation, I'm not going to bleed. I'm also getting blood out in this huge skin pool back into the system so that that helps pump up pressure. So all of these things happen in one fell swoop. You can't sort of pick and choose, right? The body engages one set of sympathetic stimulation and you get all of this as a package. Now, you and I don't deal with emergency situations very often. But we can still have some sympathetic stimulation all the time or regularly. What do we call that? What do I call this sort of sympathetic stimulation on sort of a daily basis? Yeah, stress, right? Stress. The stress that you and I feel over different things is basically the sympathetic response. It's my autonomic nervous system dealing. When do I feel stressed? Before a test, you bet. Right? Tests and quizzes. Right? Lend stress to your life. Right? What other kinds of things? Money. Money, right. Don't have enough money. I want to buy this. I want to buy this. I want to do that. I want to go there. I want to be at that concert that... You know, it all takes money. Yeah, money can be a major stress. See, the stress doesn't have to be real, does it? Oops, sorry, I went backwards. Go forwards. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, let me go back through this. Okay. Sorry. I hit the back button when I should have. Okay. Let's go forward, right? The problem doesn't have to be real, right? You're not going to die if you don't have enough money, right? If you don't pass the test, you're not going to die, okay? 
This isn't real. The, the, the stress, the, the danger out there, the quote danger, doesn't have to be real. It just has to be perceived. Right? And that's the key word here, isn't it? Perceived. If it gives you cause, if it gives you concern, right? And what are some of those things? Like failure, right? Loss. Um, years ago, I used to teach a lot of health classes. One of the chapters is always on stress. All, of, all the textbooks and all the classes typically include a stress survey for people, right? And they got sort of a checklist and they put all these different stressors that could be in a person's life and then there's a numerical value and basically what you, you do is just go through and check off what's going on in your life and then you can take those numbers and add them up and get sort of a general stress level for yourself. What do you think's at the top of the list? Loss of a loved one, right? Loss of a child would be huge, you know, loss of a spouse, family, you know, close family member, so those lost kinds of things are way at the top of the list, right? You know, other kinds of difficulties. You know, what's interesting, too, is some people don't realize, but good things in your life can be very stressful, too. What's, what's a good thing in somebody's life that might be stressful? Graduation, new job, wedding. Weddings are big time. You know, this is supposed to be a good, happy thing, but... Wow, major stress, planning one of those things, getting it together, all of that, right? Traveling, you know, I'm going on a vacation to relax, but all the preparation and the plans, and uh, you know, it could be major stress just trying to get away to relax, right? Tests, (laughs) tests and quizzes, being a student, trying to perform, trying not to fail, right? These, these are those everyday stress, and stress can be good and bad, right? Um, you don't want no stress. Most, you know, people tend to think, oh, I don't want any stress in my life. No, you don't, because that's when life is boring, right? <laughs> Certain amount of stress in our life is called eustress. That's the term that's used, eustress, and I've got enough that keeps life interesting. There's some challenges for me some problems to solve, some things to do, you know, interesting things to see, coordinating my schedule so I can go be at that concert or that play or, you know, whatever it is. But too much stress is a danger, right? Um, I always like to illustrate this by having you think about an automobile, right? Stress, the sympathetic response was meant for emergency situations. If you're under an emergency all day long, every day, you're in trouble. You know, think of it like your car. Um, What happens if my car is running all the time? What if I drive it here from home and I park it out here and I leave the engine running? I got a spare set of keys, so I lock the door, but it's just running, running, running. You know, I even have a little brick that I prop against the gas pedal, so it's idling at a high speed. You know, and then I take it home and I park in the driveway and I go in the house to relax and the car is running, 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 running. What's going to happen to my car? No, it doesn't run out of gas. It's got an unlimited gas supply. I keep feeding it all the time. Right? It's going to wear out, right? Something. I don't know what it is. And, And from make to make, from model to model, different things might wear out before others. But one way or the other, right, something is going to wear out because I'm revving it and running it all the time. And this is what stress is doing to you. And this is, this is why we have many stress-related diseases, right? Stomach ulcers. For, for one person, they get the stomach ulcer. For someone else, high blood pressure, right? Somebody else, they're under all this stress, You know, asthma can be stress-related, right? Skin problems, all sorts of different things, different ways that one person's body breaks down versus somebody else's body that breaks down. But if you're revving the engine all day long, if you're not dealing with the stress in your life, then you're susceptible to these things. (coughs) 
I don't have time to go into all of this, but you can bring this all back to excessive sympathetic stimulation. That's what all of this comes down to. It's meant to be an emergency override system. If you're having troubles, you need to deal with it. Uh, in one of the health classes I taught, we did the little stress survey. And the, I had an older woman in the class, and it was like this little light bulb went on in her head. She'd been seeing the doctor for the last six months with medical problems. It's very hard to put the finger on anything. They were trying this drug or that drug or this, and didn't seem to go away. And all of a sudden, this light goes on because, you know, if an average score is maybe 150, you know, that, that we have a certain amount of stress, you know, little stresses, accumulation of little stresses. Hers was like 600. Yeah. You know, and now you start looking at it, and she was, tra she was moving so fast all the time that she had never stopped to really look at it and say, what's going on with me? You know, teenage children, multiple teenage children, you know, a little bit out of control, right? She's snack bar mom for the little league, okay, trying to juggle all of that. She's got a full-time job, right? She works at a utility company. What's the most stressful job at a utility company? Customer service. Customer service, you bet. Calling all those people that haven't paid their bills. Why haven't you paid your bill? Trying to play God, Right? Do I shut this person off or do I give them a break for another month? You know, trying to deal with those stresses. She's going to school. She's in my class. She's got so much going on that she and her husband are butting heads. They're not communicating well. They hardly have time to communicate well. Okay. And she's sick. Is it any wonder? Stress. Right? Stress. She's got this stress level that's kind of off the charts. You can't deal with it until you realize it. All of a sudden, she realized it. She looked at it, and she went about making the changes in her life that would reduce her stress and help her to get well again. And we just have to do that. You know, there's nothing like community college students. You guys know stress. You know, I give you plenty here, okay? But you've got jobs. You've got families, right? You've got all these other things going on in your life, and you're trying to juggle this. And I talk so much about being a good student because if you solve that, the stress level in your life goes way down. Now, if you can figure out how to be a good student, you can manage this along with everything else in your life. But some people are pedaling so fast and trying to get where everything done that they never get anything done right. And there's nothing, human anatomy is not as important to you as learning to be a great student. Because if you do that, then your educational career will go well. If you would take, most people won't do it, they won't slow down their lives enough, but if you would take even a whole semester to just practice and experiment and learn what would make you a great student, you would do more for yourself than anything else. Now, I, I try and make my class sort of a friendly place to do that, but there's nothing more important than that. And, and nothing more important for you than, than dealing with your stress. I mean, to this woman's credit, she went to her boss and said, you know, this is just too much for me. You know, if, if you can't move me to another place, then I'm going to be on workman's comp here soon. You know, and the company doesn't want that, so they knew she was a good worker. She was obviously a neat person. You know, they moved her to a less stressful part of the company. You know, she got more help with a snack bar. Um, you know, started communicating, taking time out to communicate with her husband, managing the kids, talking about the stresses. You deal with it. You got to deal with it. Right? <clears throat> so there are just so many different ways that stress can manifest, manifest itself in your human body in debilitating ways. You know, what's interesting about all of this, some people, or most people, like some, and I should underline the word some, sympathetic stimulation, right? Um, what, what kind of stimulation do you think people might like? What would people do? Okay, think of like entertainment, right? Entertainment often focuses on stimulation. 
Where might you go to get stimulated? Scary movie, right? I'm thinking like an amusement park, right? But the movies, right? Right, those roller coasters, they give you plenty of stimulation. They, it's so funny, they don't look so bad sometimes from the side. When I'm looking at it, you know, I see the people going up in the cars and they're just riding down this gentle slope. What happens when I get to the top in the car by myself? It looks like it's straight down, doesn't it? It's crazy, right? The movies, right? You're sitting comfortable in a nice seat. It's padded. You got your soda and your popcorn, right? But that movie, right, is just, <laughs> ah, right? And it's that, st you know, the, the guy, the ripper, the reaper, you know, whoever comes out or, or the thriller, the car chase and all of that. If we could put monitors on you, we'd find sympathetic stimulation going on within you. But, you know, you know you're safe. And, and so you can handle and manage it. And the excitement of that is really something. Uh, there are people that, that take this to the extreme, though, right? There are people that do crazy things. They ski off things they should, that people should not ski off, right? Or they, they go shooting off something that is just, you know, you just go, why would somebody do that? You know, but there, there are just people that are junkies, people that jump off tall buildings with parachutes. And, and this is the newest one. Have you seen this thing? Have you seen pictures of this? Oh, my gosh. This guy's, you know, like a flying fox. They've got these suits, and they just go jumping off these cliffs into these deep canyons, and they're just flying, and they have this little parachute. You know, when they get down near the valley floor, they pull this little parachute. But they just, they're like these little human bats. <coughs> <coughs> oh, yes, yeah. I've seen those pictures where they're just, they're skimming. You know, they're just like feet, and they're going like, 200 miles an hour or something, you know, with their body, because they're just basically in free fall. Yeah, it's wild. But this, this is sim sympathetic stimulation, too. <coughs> now, that's the extreme. Most, most autonomic activity in your body is just tiny little subtle adjustments. You know, you stand, you're sitting right now, and your heart rate is one thing. You stand up, and you walk to your car, or you walk to your next class, and your heart rate goes up. That's a little bit of sympathetic stimulation. You sit down in your car, you sit down in your next class, your heart rate goes back down. Most, most autonomic activity is just tiny little subtle adjustments. Now, where does this come to human anatomy? Well, let's bring this all into human anatomy then. There are sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves throughout the human body that are speeding up and slowing down various organs and various structures. And I know you can't see it real clearly in this picture as such, but you've got this picture. This is chapter 16. Page 571 is the other one. Yeah, this one, I'm not sure what page this is, but <coughs> this kind of lays it all out, I think, a little better. The other picture is a, a nice anatomical view of things. This kind of spreads it out. And really the goal here is to see that there are two separate sets of nerves. There's one set of nerves for sympathetic stimulation, and there's another set of nerves for parasympathetic stimulation. Most of the sensory stuff here is going directly into the brain, like all of the uh, chemical stuff is, is being sensed right from the blood, right in the brain. There are a few sensory nerves from some organs that go into the medulla to sense what's going on mechanically in your body. These are basically the motor nerves, right? The autonomic nervous system is going to have sensory and motor kinds of pathways. We really, when we explain this, we really focus mostly on the motor pathways. <coughs> <coughs> Now, what are some of the things that you should notice about this? Well, here are the sympathetic nerves. And by the way, is this dumb or what? If you think of speeding up your body, what color would you put with speeding up? Yeah, wouldn't you? And if you were nice and calm and peaceful, what, 
What color would you have? <coughs> I just think it's so bizarre that they switched the colors on this. Sympathetic is blue. Parasympathetic is red. Crazy. Anyway, overlook that. Notice that all sympathetic nerves come straight out of the spinal cord, don't they? All sympathetic nerves come out from T1 down to about L2. And the nerves do an interesting thing. They don't go straight to um, the organs. Because notice, if I'm coming out here at the spinal cord, I still need to reach branches way back up into the head. Even all the things that were near the brain or near these centers, the pathway leads down through the spinal cord and then back up to the head. But there's an interface here. There is a structure here called the sympathetic chain ganglia. Right? Sympathetic chain ganglia. And um, this is a little bit like a key chain. Right? <coughs> this picture right here showed you that communicating ramus. And this right here was representing little bits of the sympathetic chain right here. Right? Now, what are ganglia again? Gray matter, right? Little islands, little processing centers here. And so quite a bit of the processing with this autonomic nervous system takes place out here, right? This, is, this chain ganglia, think of like the key chain, you know, these little ones with the little metal beads in it. That's, that's kind of what you're thinking about. And the nerve pathways are coming out of the spinal cord, but coming through this communicating ramus and then back out, right? So it goes into here, and then branches go up and down through this chain and then out to the various structures. Okay? And these nerve ways are sending the signals that give you that sympathetic sense in, throughout your human body. Um, even things like this. Notice that there's a nerve pathway right to the adrenal gland. This is why you get that adrenaline rush instantly. You don't have to wait for the hypothalamus to make a hormone for that to circulate through the body, and now I'm revved up. No. I've got a nerve directly to the adrenal gland. Adrenaline gets released into the bloodstream immediately. And that's one of those. You can see here some of the parasympathetic nerves coming over. This is one of those places where you... You've got no parasympathetic nervous uh, innervation to try and slow down the release of adrenaline. Adrenaline just kind of gets hit, it gets released, and then you just got to let it kind of wear off. Okay? Now, the parasympathetic side of things, if you look at the parasympathetic side, notice that there are no, no nerves here in this central spinal cord that... 90% of all of the parasympathetic nerves come directly out of the brain. Next week, one of our topics is the cranial nerves. We're going to look at the cranial nerves, the ones that come directly out of the brain, and they're going to have sensory functions and motor functions, but we're also going to see that a number of cranial nerves have parasympathetic function. We'll say these, are, these nerves have autonomic activity. But that's all going to be parasympathetic, the slowing, the peaceful. You know, the word we used for it when I was in college was mellow. I was thinking of that word. That, that relates right to it. Oh, we're real mellow right now, which meant you were all relaxed. <clears throat> so parasympathetic. Now, the parasympathetic nerves reach all the way down. See, from the brain, you're coming out into the body and then coming all the way down here even into the digestive system. Only place you can't quite reach, the extreme lower portions, there's a few sacral nerves that have parasympathetic branches for them. But that's just to really, you know, reach the lowest parts of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Most of it comes here. And see how all of this is on one nerve right here? You saw this nerve. We dissected this nerve in the cat. Remember it? When we were down here in the thoracic cavity, we, did, we found two major nerves, the phrenic and the vagus. That's okay. Keep guessing. You're participating. That's good. No, the vagus nerve, right? See what this vagus nerve? It is the major parasympathetic nerve for the entire ventral cavity, 
right? And the, the medical rule for the vagus nerve is the diaphragm is a separator. Above the diaphragm slows things down. Below the diaphragm speeds things up, right? Digestion is a parasympathetic activity. It makes you feel good. Makes you relaxed. How do you feel after you've had a big Thanksgiving meal? You know, or any big feast. You're tired, relaxed, ready to sit down on the couch and take a snooze, right? You watch animals out in the wild. They eat a big meal and they go lie under a tree and take a nap, right? Parasympathetic activity. Parasympathetic activity is one way to counter the stress in your life, the sympathetic activity. So what do some people do to deal with their stress? They, they eat. Yes, they do. They eat because that's going to engage the parasympathetic side of things and make them feel better. That's why we call some foods comfort foods. Right? Almost all food is truly comfort food, but some of it has the taste that, that goes along with it. But... We do, to, to try and manage the sympathetic side of things, we're typically trying to do things with the parasympathetic side. Meditation, relaxation techniques, all of these things engage the parasympathetic side. Of all of this, there is there's one, one autonomic process that is actually one that you can control. Of all these autonomic processes that we've talked about, which is the one that you can actually consciously control too? It works for you, but if you want to alter it, you can do it easily. What? Breathing, yes. Breathing. Why is breathing always a part of relaxation and meditation techniques? Because it's the one autonomic function that you can control. If you slow your breathing as much as possible, you can engage your parasympathetic system. And I, I understand that a lot of you haven't been aware of this before or maybe have not really thought about where, are, where am I and my stress levels? And what is stress doing to me? Um, I, am, I am thoroughly sure, I am convinced that most people in any class could get more points on a test if they had less stress than they do with the stress that they live with. You know? And you see it. You know, you see the students that right before the test, they've still got their papers out. They're still looking at them. One more thing. One more thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was that. Oh, yeah. One more thing. One more thing. Oh, put it, oh okay. Put it, put it away. Put it away. Okay. Give me the test. Right? Okay, I'm ready. Sure you are. Okay. What did you just do to yourself? Stressing yourself out right to the beginning of the test. How many points are you going to miss because of your stress level versus how many actual points did you gain? I'll bet the balance is always to the worse. You know? You want to be a good test taker? should really put five minutes before it's going to start, you really should put it all away and just say, what's done is done. Maybe unless you forgot one major thing that you should have done before the quiz. You know. But for most tests, you've done what you've done. Another five minutes of looking at a couple of things. Yes, maybe you'll have looked at one thing that was on the test. But how many did you give up going into the test with this sympathetic stimulation? You know, if you missed five questions because you were so uptight versus the one that you did get, is that a good trade? I don't think so. Right? And, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of something to eat right before you take the test. Not a lot. You don't want to just get so parasympathetic that you're just too relaxed. But maybe just a little bit of comfort food, a little bite of chocolate or something before you take that test would just give you that little bit of edge and just kind of... Just relax you a little bit. You know, maybe a little bit of meditation where you're just, okay, you're just getting away from it, calming down, so that what you've learned, what's in here, can easily come out. Stress can block your ability to reach back into your memory and really pull things out comfortably. 
that, that you've put in there. So this, this whole autonomic side of things has got so many implications beyond just running your human body. It's so much a part of what you and I do and behave like every day. So along with learning your anatomy here, deal with your stress. Okay? So make sure that you know where the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves come from. Right? Make sure you, you understand, you know, uh, you ought to be able to take those four processes that I've used, you know, heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, and digestion. Tell me what's going on sympathetically or parasympathetically. Right? Because sympathetic side of things speeds up three out of the four, right? But it slows down digestion because you don't need to be digesting in danger situations. Okay. All right. Okay.